So we are here to talk about the tweens and education and learning behavior. And this is um, set up, this format is set up to be really question and answer. So um, each of the panelists are gonna give just a couple of minutes about their area of expertise and then we're gonna open it up to questions. So hopefully you have a lot of questions and um, we will get going. Let me just see if I, oh, it goes back to the end. How do I go backwards? Oh, I did it, okay. So um, the, first one, it, the first person we have is Allison Ballard, and I'll let each of you introduce yourselves. And so Allison, if you wanna get started. Yeah, so I'm Allison Ballard. I'm the pediatric nurse practitioner and clinical care coordinator at Children's Hospital Colorado. And kind of my role there is um, to be a resource liaison and kind of the main point of contact for patients and families. I think um, what often happens in multidisciplinary clinics, you're seeing a lot of people. Um, I often get, you know, now who do I talk to about this? Or do I talk to you? So I think really kind of bringing together that team and helping unify that communication um, is really helpful for, for navigating um, patients and families really with any concern. Um, I think also, if you haven't had a situation, I think we talked a lot about emergencies. You don't know what you don't know until you need it. Um, so hopefully everybody having that person, their person at the center, their main point of contact, who they can call and pull in all of the different individual specialties to make sure there is really good comprehensive communication. Um, so you're getting the appropriate care and all the needs for your child. And Gretchen? Um, hi, I am Gretchen Egner. My son Nick is 23, and so I navigated the um, IEP 504 plan process for him, and I also teach high school English, so I have seen the um, IEP process go through, and when we look at our kids, we, if, if you've heard Rachel Callender when she spoke yesterday and spoke this morning, sometimes we, we receive information from a deficit model. And when we're really concerned about our kids and we want them to be safe first and foremost, but we want them to be protected when we release them into school and when they're with strangers and other kids. And so I think we as a group can be too protective and prevent them from achieving independence and doing those things. And so anything that we can do to be assertive and see things from an asset model, what they can do while maintaining safety and keeping them as protected, but then also helping them leave the nest will allow them to be more independent as they get to high school, hopefully college, and then if we're lucky, navigating in the wild on their own. And Claudia Senesak is a PT from University of Florida, and she's gonna show us some slides about adaptive PE. Because Claudia is an overachiever, so. <laughs> oh, if I sit down, Thank my mic's you, gonna Alan. fall off. Thank <laughs> you, So uh, I'm a pediatric physical therapist and a clinical professor at the University of Florida. And, um, uh, oh. Are Claudia's slides loaded? Those aren't mine. No, go. <laughs> okay. All right, well, we have a minute. Oh, there we go. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I also have a small private practice, so I'm still practicing as a physical therapist and seeing lots of children with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So I just wanted to um, emphasize a couple of things as we're, we're talking today. So it's really important to stay active and engaged is, is just really important. So things that parents should be thinking about is what should be focused on, uh, particularly in the school system because it's a totally different model. They don't function on a medical model, they function on an educational model. So it's a very different approach uh, to your child. We know that not exercising leads to atrophy, and, 
exercising can be defined in a lot of different ways. And it's, it's not necessarily lifting weights or doing uh, hard work for your muscles. And then what do your children like? And um, how can they do it? And how can we help them do it is going to be really important. Safety, is the activity fun? Are they participating? And really, it's a team approach. And part of the team is the family. And then programming your GPS to arrive at the right destination is going to be really important. And knowing your child's body so that you can talk to people in the school system about your child, uh, about what they're capable of doing. If they have range of motion problems, if they have some contractures, are they falling? What is their endurance like? How will they get around the campus? Uh, how can people on campus help them get around the campus? And then this particular time period that we're talking about, late childhood and tweens, can often be a period of transition. So it's going to require a lot of education, educating people in the educational system. So, and that's going to actually fall on parents to do that. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about adaptation. And what does that word mean? What does adaptation mean? So it can mean a change to better suit the environment and a change that better suits your child. And taking advantage of opportunities that may arise. And what does that mean for you, making opportunities for your child and making those opportunities happen in the school system? And then that may require behavioral changes. And that's going to be all encompassing. It may mean that your behavior has to change. It may mean that your child's behavior has to change. And it may mean that the school system has to change in some way. And it may mean that the PE teacher's behavior has to change. And you may decide that PE might not be for your child. And that's OK. That's perfectly OK in the school system. And the other thing that I wanted to stress is that mentally and emotional wellness is really important. And there's a lot of research that, that shows that movement really helps people feel better. It doesn't have to be jumping jacks and running and jumping and all of those things. It just has to be movement. And it can be any number of things that allow a child to move or assisted movement. And that's going to make them feel better about themselves. Plan things around routines. There are home routines. There are school routines. There are family routines and community routines. Find something that fits into these routines. And then all of a sudden, these things that maybe a physical therapist like myself is asking you to do, if it fits into a routine, then it becomes so much easier and so much more likely that you will do it. And then find something spontaneous to do that's just fun, something your child doesn't expect you to do that's maybe outside the routine. And I don't think I have to go any further. We can just ask questions. OK, great. So we will open it up to questions. Um, is there somebody that wants to start? Yes, David. Um, Before you start, I'll repeat the question because we, I don't know that the room can hear it and the re people remote can't hear it either. So David, make sure I paraphrase it correctly. Um, there's a lot of research going on in exercise right now. And David is asking, Claudia, what's your opinion on good exercise versus bad exercise? Did I capture that correctly, David? Yeah. OK. So it's a really excellent question. It's a really good question. And it's a question 
not only that parents and families have, but it, it's still a question that researchers have. Um, I think what we know right now is that eccentric exercise, exercise that puts a load on muscles, is still thought to be damaging to the muscle, regardless of whether you're on steroids or whether you're on one of the interventional drugs, um, or, and whether or not you're um, whether or not you've been dosed with a gene therapy drug, because an eccentric contraction is a contraction where the muscle is shortened and it's requiring the muscle to lengthen over time. And it requires a tremendous amount of control within and between muscle fibers to do that. And that presents a heavy load on the muscles. What are those examples of that? An example of that would be walking downstairs where you have one leg on the stair behind and you have the leg that's leading to step down on the, on the uh, descending stair. And we know as able-bodied uh, individuals that while we're doing that, we may be very adept at doing it, so we don't think about the control in our muscles that's required for that. But as we look at older adults as they're doing it and they're still able-bodied, we notice that they're slowing down as they carefully try to control that contraction, that lengthening contraction. And so for boys that are weaker, and we know that proximal muscles like quadriceps and hamstrings are affected um, quicker than our distal, than distal muscles are. Those muscles are having a much more difficult time controlling those kinds of contractions because they have lost more contractile tissue. If I had the choice between riding a bike and swimming, I would pick swimming. However, cycling has been shown in research articles to be beneficial if there's no resistance on the pedaling, so not a bike that changes gears, and if you're on level surfaces and not going up inclines. And for some boys, that may still be difficult, However, there are adaptive bikes that can assist on the pedaling part. The most difficult part of cycling is when the pedal is down and you have to pull the pedal back up. And so there are some adaptive bikes that have a pulley system on the front to the pedal so that when the pedal is down, it assists with bringing the pedal back up. And then of course we have e-bikes now too that um, you know, assist with, those, with that particular motion as well. So biking is a great exercise. It's just there are caveats to let's not add resistance to it and let's keep it on level ground. And you can also do a three-wheel bike if balance is precarious. Anyone else? Okay, I'll ask a question because I have a whole list in my head for all three of you. So um, my next question I'm going to address to Claudia and then I have one for the three of you. So I asked this question in a panel the other day and I didn't really get a good answer. What is your thought on the Apple Watch? And there's all of these things that you can look up now. So it tells you um, if you're putting your feet down evenly or you're at risk to fall. It tells you how much your steps, your, if your steps are shortening or lengthening. What, what's your thoughts on that? And do you see any use for that in the future, both in understanding how safe um, someone with Duchenne is still walking, and is it predictable for someone coming off their feet? Um, it's a really good question, and technology is just advancing very quickly in this area. In terms of, I'll answer the last part first. In terms of it being predictive, of someone coming off their feet. We don't have enough research right now to uh, say whether or not it is predictive because we don't have enough data on that. There are a couple of groups that are looking at that. 
in terms of using it, um, having a child wear it, um, and then having maybe a parent monitoring it, I can see where that could potentially be a really good tool to monitoring whether or not your child has overdone it, has maybe exerted themselves too much, because not only are you monitoring um, number of steps throughout the day and step length and those kinds of things, maybe number of falls, but you're also looking at heart rate and potentially respiratory rate. And I think those things are also gonna be critical because we know that you know, the heart is playing a really big role in Duchenne. And so the more we can monitor that during periods of exertion without having to be in a laboratory setting, the more accurate information we get about how exercise and exertion um, affects heart. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'll go on to my next question then. So my next question, I wanna talk a little bit about adaptive PE. And in my experience, that can be a difficult um, hurdle through the school system. So I'd like to hear all three of you and your input. So Claudia, what, how can you work with your outside PT to tailor what you need adaptive gym to look like in school? And I'm thinking mostly in the grammar school, in the grade school level, um, high school is a little different. And then Gretchen, how do, how do you get adaptive P put into the um, 504 plan or the IEP plan? And then Allison, how can families reach out to the clinic to get the assistance they need if they're having trouble with adaptive P? Do you want me to start? Sure. <laughs> um, as I said, uh, physical therapy in the school system is under a very different model. So getting physical therapy in the school system has to be based on an educational model. And that educational model basically translates into, to get therapy, it has to enhance the educational experience in school. So for instance, getting stretching in a school system is very hard to get. Um, but to work on something like positioning at, at a desk or ergonomics at a desk where I want their feet positioned, I want them sitting up more upright while they're working versus their legs just dangling um, with no support to actually stabilize them. Those are things that can be done um, in the school system very readily. If the child is getting private therapy outside of the school, then you can set up a consultation. And I've actually gone to IEP meetings with families uh, to sit in and sort of get that two cents in there to educate not only the IEP team that's there, but the physical therapist who will often view a child with Duchenne as weak which will frequently translate to, let's strengthen this child. So um, I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you. And Gretchen? For the um, adaptive PE part, as we're, we're like late elementary, middle school, because when tween um, has an odd context to it, because some schools, middle school starts in fifth grade, and others it's not till seventh grade. Um, when your child is diagnosed, um, that's usually when you know you introduce that to the school system. There's probably one PE teacher for the entire school, and they get to know your child, what they can and can't do. You have a better relationship, I think, as a parent with that teacher. And then when you shift to elementary or to middle school, whatever grade that is, um, that's when the, 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 there may be more than one PE teacher. There may be several. They see several classes a day. And that's when I think it becomes more important for you to have that connection and that, that school person who knows your child and the, the you know, like, like his condition is changing. And so we have this lessening of 
ability and maybe an increase in concern of a fall if they are, if they are moving. And um, by the time a child gets to high school, we can usually waive PE altogether and they don't need it. Like my son Nick never had PE um, in, I don't think middle school or high school because it wasn't, it wasn't necessary. But if kids are more active, as Claudia said, movement is important to, you know, to an extent. So making sure that they're doing those activities. And I would say having a point person, um, even if, especially if your child does not have a uh, learning component to their needs. If the 504 has strictly been for that PT consult and making sure that there is safety and you know trying to get classes all on the first floor of a building if you can, making sure if they're you know if they need an elevator they have the, the like an elevator the pass that we have an emergency plan in place. With um, I talked to someone yesterday about making sure that there's an evacuation chair um, at the top of um, every staircase. Um, and that they, they should have that so that if they do need to evacuate, they're not you know, waiting for the paramedics to get there to, at the top of the stairs to get them out. Like that's unacceptable. Um, but from a, from a gym standpoint, um, having a person that recognizes that uh, you know, our ch children's care is, is different and it's not typical where they, you know, if they just climb the stairs more, they're gonna get better at it and they need to build up those strong calf muscles that they have. Um, making sure that everyone who works directly with your child is aware that that, that you know, it's a different condition, I think is important if I answered that. Yes, thank you. And Allison, how, how can they work with the clinic to get the needs met at the school level? Yeah, I think um, partnering with your clinic team um, to be an advocate on your child's behalf is really important. Um, being able to provide the accurate information in terms of what their level of functioning is, what their needs are, um, and really being that advocate for them. Um, one child might really benefit from having a one-to-one -one para. Some might say that's over intrusive. I, want, I don't want this person following me around all day and really kind of looking and balancing safety, their medical needs while at school and really educating school staff on the diagnosis. Um, also helping families navigate how to get those things at school, making sure the emergency um, evacuation plan is included in their IEP, making sure um, you're educating the gym teacher on how to engage um, the kids, even if they're not maybe doing some of the activities, they're really participating, they're not um, sitting to the side. Um, so a lot, I think, education in terms of being inclusive, how to include them um, in the school day. If we feel like PT, OT, um, speech therapy, getting you know them on IEPs so we can say, no, you have to provide these things in your school. Um, advocating for equipment in the school, making sure, no, you actually have to purchase the Hoyer lift. You have to have these things um, to allow this child access for toileting. So I think really, just being a huge advocate and educator to the school system um, is important. And making sure your clinic team is aware of any problems that you, know, you might be having with the school or lack of understanding. Um, and it's every year I feel like kind of re-educating um, and I, being able to provide that for everybody. And I would just reiterate with that as well, as you go from that elementary model where you know, your child sees two or three or four educators a day to that intermediate or middle school model where, where the teachers are rotating through classes and things change. Um, that need for, you know, they have to have, if they're in a wheelchair, they have to have a table that they can scoot up to. And if the table's not in there and the teacher is trying to make sure, okay, there's a table, that inclusivity and that thinking ahead of, okay, where is my child gonna sit? And, and is this student going to be naturally in groups with other people and trying to make that as seamless as possible 
so that our kids aren't sitting off to the side and it's an afterthought because they pick up on that stuff really fast. And so the, the, their, their anxiety and their emotions play into how well they're going to receive instruction and participate and do those things. And as we learn more about mental and emotional health, that plays into their ability to receive the academics and do well overall. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think sometimes as parents, we forget that the clinic team is available with resources to assist us. We get caught up in what the school is telling us and we don't necessarily know where to go to find out what other options might be available. And so it is important to remember to go back to your clinic team, the PT that you see in clinic, the, the coordinator, and they have a lot of experience. They see a lot of um, patients who have a lot of different IEPs and they certainly have a lot of experience in creative ways to um, meet the needs of your student and keeping them incorporated in what the school day looks like. Okay, so I'm talking a lot. Let's get some questions in the audience here. <laughs> I see somebody now, that's good. Um, okay, so my question is, my son is about to turn 12, so he'll be starting middle school. He'll be going to sixth grade in the fall. And PE is the thing that's keeping me up at night <laughs> because I just don't know how they're going to handle that. Um, we did have a 504 meeting with the elementary school and the middle school counselor right at the end of the school year, but they don't know who his PE teacher will be yet. So I do plan to meet with the PE teacher before school starts. It, are there resources for you know, a typical middle school PE curriculum and here are ways to adapt it for a, a person with Duchenne. Um, ben still can walk, he uses the wheelchair for longer distances, so that almost makes me more nervous because of what Gretchen was talking about. The PE teacher sees, oh, he's weak at this, let's, let's help him strengthen those muscles. Um, so I just worry about that whole middle school. There's so many so many people that are going to be working with him um, and how do I manage to make sure that, that they understand what the limitations are. Um, and then that was the big question. And he doesn't have an IEP, he just has a 504 because he doesn't need any educational goals. So how do we get that into the 504? And uh, Gretchen, you mentioned you your boy, your son had PE waived for middle school and high school. So, how does that happen? In our in the meeting that I had, they seem very resistant to waiving that PE requirement in middle school. Um, so, I don't. My thought is, let's just go ahead and give it a try and see how it goes. And then, if something's not working, then we can talk about waiving it. In our school system, they also do two weeks of PE, two weeks of health, so it's back and forth. So I do want him to get that health curriculum, but I just worry about the PE piece of it. So any thoughts you guys have on that? Okay. Well, in, in McGuanago, or in Wisconsin, um, uh, middle school was seventh and eighth grade, and Nick already had the power chair and was using it some of the time. And so when you looked at Nick and we said wave PE, they didn't have a problem with that because they weren't sure, you know, how would you incorporate that? Um, and he started with a 504. And I think the, um, the purpose for that was it gave, a person was assigned to Nick at the school. And so it was someone from the special education department. And so that person was who I worked with to see, I think he, they had a stander and he was using the stander once a week and they coordinated the bus and his, um, the, the middle school was on one level but choir was up five stairs and so he had one of those lifts that was ancient that someone had to go get the custodian to get the key to get the lift <laughs> to get up. And so th there was a person that he connected with which as a parent, knowing that there's someone who that's the person that is fielding your calls and your concerns. I think that is important. And then Nick didn't need an IEP for education things. However, um, when you take the ACT test, and that's like our state test that we take, is the ACT and other things like that that are timed, Nick needed extra time for those perhaps in case he had to go to the bathroom 
somewhere during them because it would take him so much longer to get that. And then I think we did also have uh, some kind of need for an IEP, and this is probably a Wisconsin rule that I could have fought if I was better at fighting things, but, um, or if I had been at the time, because I'm much better at fighting now. But um, to get OT and PT, and however many minutes they give you in that, there had to be an IEP, like it was a paperwork yeah, it has thing. To be in place. Yeah, and so for, for those consults and to have that and then to use the, the stander and to get in the stander and then um, for special education transportation, I think as well because with the wheelchair he took that bus and that would pick him up early because it had to go to the other school or something. But I would say it is scary when your child can walk and if he can run and do those things, because you know if he falls, he's at greater risk for harm. And the lay person does not see that. And you know this from being in the community. We know more sometimes than those doctors that they see. We definitely know more than the average educator. And even if they have seen a child in a wheelchair before, even if they've seen a child with Duchenne before, they haven't seen your kid and there's so much variability. And you know, what we know now versus what we knew 10 years ago, that has changed as well. And so having one person that is the focus person that you go to, and then um, also things, things are gonna change in these three years as our boys are transitioning, as things are happening with their condition. And so, so to have that person realize that like that you're gonna be calling them and, and I'm, I'm running on, but um, you have those meetings every year to update the 504 and the IEP, but things could change in, in that interim and it, they have to know it could be flexible and things are going to change. Jessica, have you, have you seen, or any of you seen the assignment of full-time aides as a result of the IEP and the school district will be to do that and with the boys that you send that they'll have a full-time aide in the school to address all these issues? Okay, David's asking about full-time aides and having aides. And um, I, I have not had students with Duchenne at, at my school, um, but I am a firm believer in having children who can do what they can, do what they can. And I am cautious of trying to get your child every single service that they possibly could um, and, and having an aide. So if someone needs one, yes, they, you know, they, they should have one. Um, but for Nick, uh, in high school, he had an, there was an elevator, and uh, his person helped him jerry-rig this stick that he had that he used when he was in college <laughs> as well. And if, if we could have found it, we would have done the night hack on it. But we, it was hooked up to his wheelchair, and um, I think it was like, like, like they used the, one of the flagpoles from the, from the classroom, and he could use it to push the elevator button so he could take the elevator by himself, but the teacher had the walkie-talkie that was in his side bag so that if there was some kind of emergency, he'd be able to say, yo, I can't, I can't do this, or I dropped my pole in the elevator, or like whatever, um, whatever happened. But you know, some kids need aids, maybe, um, but we would always have like, like the teacher would know Nick's got his book in the side pocket, or he had books that were at home, and now of course, you know, there's technology, there are fewer textbooks, but there would be somebody, okay, like if you need a book, here's your book, here's your person in college, there were aides that would be responsible for taking off his coat and things like that. So the, the full-time aide, selfishly, that it takes away resources from the school district to have one aide for your kid, but it reduces their independence as well. I think just to add a little bit to that, um, I think aids are very personal, and like Gretchen said, some kids really need an aid, and some kids get away without one. But Duchenne typically is a diagnosis that will allow an aid. Um, one of the arguments you'll sometimes hear from a school district is we hate to give an aid um, because the child becomes dependent, and really the, the counter to that argument is this child's going to become dependent. So we're not worried about the fact that we're taking away this child's independence because that's the nature of where the course of where this disease is going. So I think if you feel like your child needs an aid, either because they need educational assistance or because they're a safety risk. So some boys are much more risk adverse than others. Um, if you have a boy that's really 
willing to take to make risky decisions, that's probably somebody who needs eyes on them most of the time in the school. If you have a very risk adverse child, they're probably okay. But that's a personal decision that you have to make. I would ask that, or I would encourage you to include your clinic if you're not sure what you think. Um, they also have a lot of experience in kids that have AIDS at school and kids that don't, and what sort of needs there are. Um, but I think if you're, if you're comfortable, certainly don't, they don't need an aid. If you think your child needs an aid, don't feel bad about asking for it. It is certainly an acceptable solution in the schools. I wanted to just go back for a minute on the adaptive PE question. Um, I know you said that you were thinking about going ahead and trying adaptive PE. And, um, you know, I think, I think that's a great idea. It's the nature of the school system to not know who the PE teacher is right now until school starts. But once you do find out, you can schedule a meeting with them and try and figure out what the curriculum is. Sometimes they know and sometimes they don't know. Hopefully you have a PE teacher that says, okay, our first unit is gonna be this, our second unit is gonna be this. And then talk to them about, well, what is the role that my son can you know, have in that particular unit? And it could be, maybe your son gets the equipment ready for that particular unit if it's too uh, robust of a unit. Maybe they're gonna be out and they're gonna be doing um, you know, soccer or something out on the field and you don't feel that that's gonna be appropriate for your son. Maybe they can be the person that helps get the equipment out there and uh, you know, marks maybe the field for that particular day or keeps the score or, um, you know, think of different creative things that are still part of the game that are participating. And so he's still part of the action, but he's not out there risking, um, you know, getting too tired, overexerting, or having an injury while playing the particular game. <laughs> well, and then when you, you know, when you run into problems, then you probably need to consult with someone outside of the school system. In addition to that, something Gretchen said was, it may be time to get an IEP so that you do have the ability to bring in the PT, the OT that's in the school system that can run interference for you with the PE coach to help educate them, to help them figure out what is the adaptation that we can do in this particular unit for your son to participate. It's really finding what are those opportunities in this particular activity that will be right for your son so that he can participate. And, and it, with a creative mind, you can do that. It's getting your right resources, those people that can help you do that. And the IEP can, can actually help you get to those resources. It's not that he has to have PT and pulled out of class once a week or twice a week. It's just that they're available to you to run down and make that connection with your PE person. And it might be helpful to ask the school PT and OT to meet with you with the gym teacher. Oftentimes totally. they have really creative solutions that the gym teacher wouldn't think about. Good. That's great, so the PT is very involved, just to share that with everyone else. Brian. Busing services, when you have uh, when you have OT and PT, whether it's consultative or direct services, that's how that is provided, and that's how you migrate. It can be offered in 504, but there are no. significantly more protections under under it can be, uh, but but it's certainly more protection under IEP. Absolutely. So just to re reiterate, because I don't think Brian's mic'd, um, the 504 
the, the IEP is a legal document, and part of the process of qualifying for an IEP includes other services. So it doesn't necessarily require a learning disability to be at, um, to have an IEP available. So I think that's the gist of what Brian was saying. So needing things like safety during gym class and OT and PT consults should be enough with a diagnosis like Duchenne to qualify for an IEP. And once you qualify for an IEP, um, it does open the door for more resources that you can lean on as the disease progresses to make sure that your son is getting or daughter is getting what they need. I think and we had getting a that, getting your clinic involved, having prescriptions written, referrals written that say, you know, Joey needs PT and PT consult in the school system, OT consult in the school system. That that has to be part of that document for the IEP. And ideally, they know this in the schools, and you know they are they are well versed at this. And having that connection, having that that sole person, that's you know, when you're getting the 504, that should happen. But there's variability, and so again, you know, you may have to begin that conversation and switch that that focus. That that's what. And you I need. think also understanding you had mentioned he's up at night having a lot of anxiety about. What's that? Oh, that's you. Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> so I guess my question is, what, what about PE is making you feel anxious? Um, and then working with that clinic team to say, it doesn't sound like maybe the school can support those needs. How can we help, you know, um, in terms of coming at it from different angles? And I think we have a question here, this gentleman. Would you mind walking over to the mic? What happens is on the live stream, um, it's on either side, I'm sorry. On the live stream, they can't hear when we're not mic'd. That's why I was repeating Brian's question. Thank you. So I, I just had kind of comments. So I've got a 22-year-old and a 14-year-old, and I've been through this process quite a lot every year. So uh, my younger son started with a 504, and then in that's preschool, and then transitioned to IEP because of uh, some delayed uh, intellect things. But, but at any rate, one of the things that we found successful, and I just wanted to share, is that we made the IEP meetings every six weeks or every eight weeks as an update because we are dealing with a progressive disease. And so what is documented at the beginning of that school year or calendar year can change throughout the year. And so I, at least our school district, we're very fortunate. We have good APE, we have good OT, PT, et cetera. Um, but <clears throat> not only did I want to make sure that all the educators knew that we were uh, telling them what the progression with the things to look out for elementary school, maybe there wasn't as much change, but as they get older, the changes occur more often, more frequently. I would always say, make sure you're looking out for falls uh, the, the, how brittle the bones are, et cetera, and th those type of things with the steroid use. Um, and the other thing that was very helpful for us in, in, as it relates to APE or what, what have you is we would, at the beginning of the school year, before his kids got in school, is have a meeting, an IEP meeting with all the educators, even this, the lunch ladies, et cetera, so that everybody was aware, and we used PPMD's resources, uh, the 34-page uh, the or 42-page document that for educators. And so I was able to share that in advance of our meeting, and a lot of the educators would come to the meeting with questions, but at least they were aware, and I wanted them to see our faces to know that we really care about our son and our, our, our children and their safety, et cetera. So there are things that they wouldn't think, uh, from an atypical standpoint, they wouldn't know what to look out for, but we could explain that to them, and that brought a lot more awareness. So, for example, with PE, we would say, okay, our son can't do these type of things, but maybe he's really good at keeping a timer or uh, going through the different drills and, you know, very active part of that uh, group and, and felt like it was a meaningful uh, participation and inclusiveness. So th those are just some things. Sorry, I didn't mean to hijack. I just wanted to share those thoughts. No, thank you very much. Okay. I think that's, oh, it's always good to hear from other people's experiences. I think that's how we all learn. Do we have a virtual question, Brian? 
No, just to follow up to my question about related services, and it, this is an age group in which we are looking at loss of ambulation or potential loss of ambulation, but also some of the kids ha are having um, endurance and strength um, deficits that they're starting to develop them. Um, and I, I wondered if the group would talk about things like um, adaptations to writing, because writing we think of it as an effortless task, but when you have muscular dystrophy, it can be very burdensome. Um, maybe some of those types of things that may come to mind. Well, I would say we have, there's voice to text technology now. Um, they have um, like, like the pens that you don't have to use as much um, force on to, you know, to write things, but I think our, the dictation technology has become much better. And again, that's another reason to, when you have that point person that's part of the special education department, typically that is part of more of a, um, you know, a, a specific set learning disability that people are discovering in class, but this is a specifically a physical condition that's appearing, you know, instead of someone getting better, their ability to perform this task is declining over time. And so making sure that all the teachers are aware that that could be happening because I think our kids tend to, some, some of our kids will, you know, compensate and work harder and get more tired and get more fatigued and we may not recognize that, well, they're, they're still trying to perform really well but they are fatiguing and so for, to have teachers looking out for those. Um, the, the one that comes to mind the most to me is that dictation software because I think it's becoming so much better than it was even three or four years ago. I, I, well, and, and there's similar much better stuff. programs out there than Dragon Speak, but that was one of the original ones. Um, in general, most school districts will do a technological evaluation. Um, and sixth grade is probably, fifth or sixth grade is a good time to start looking at that. And that's another reason to maybe look at an IEP as opposed to a 504, is it's easier to get those outside consults. But I would um, recommend that a technological assessment is a good time. And that's the person that will come in from the special education um, area and take a look at what, where your child's needs are and what can they do technologically to make things easier. And most districts are using computers all the time anyway or Chromebooks, so your son or daughter doesn't look that different. Um, they just have a different ability to um, it, like talk to text and some of the other technological things that are out there that make things easier. And we tried to make sure that if the child can demonstrate proficient knowledge, but maybe it's with two math questions instead of 10 math questions, or they could have a verbal response to you know, that portion of the learning curriculum versus a written out paragraph. So trying to also give teachers other ideas how they can measure successful learning um, without fatigue. Yeah. I think that goes back to the IEP where you can get accommodations built in to um, the IEP for things like testing um, as well as having all these other consults. And I think the real value of the IEP is it's a document that teachers are used to. So they may not be used True. to the physical accommodations. They may not be used to needing an OT consult. They may not be used to a kid with Duchenne. But what they are used to is the fact that they have to follow what the IEP says. And so there's always people that are resistant to change. And the IEP is a tool to make sure that that change happens regardless of whether or not that individual gym teacher, English teacher, band teacher, whomever it is, thinks that's the way things should work. And so the IEP just has some more teeth to it, and it's something that the school is used to using. And even if it's not Duchenne, they're used to the process of the IEP. And not to, like, and, and I, I shouldn't say this as a teacher, don't tell my principal, but, <laughs> but I mean, I mean it, 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 as you said, teeth. I mean, as, I mean, you know, your teachers are, are, are doing a good job, they, they want to do their best job, they, you know, they, they want to educate our kids, but we're busy and we're overwhelmed. And in the middle school and high school, you can have 150 kids a day and a 504, at least, in, you know, it's like a little thing over there, like it's still kind of a legal document, but IEP, as a parent, if that IEP isn't being followed, if you say that IEP isn't being followed, that that has that has more weight. Like a teacher is going to be like, oh, okay, it is important in the things I have to do. I have to make sure that this is addressed. 
there can be ramifications if it's not. Yeah, and they know that. Teachers know that. Uh, you know, it's, to Gretchen's point, I think two things about an IEP. You're right, it's a legal document. Is don't be afraid to have an advocate. Most school districts have other parents who will help you through the IEP. And the other piece is don't be afraid to ask. That, in other words, there's sometimes reluctance to ask. You could ask for the sky. They, all they could do is say no. But I think the idea of having an advocate for particularly new parents is critical. And they're available free from other parents in a lot of school districts. I so, mean, oh, go ahead, so, Brian. So briefly, just tying what you're saying about the, the question I'd asked about uh, accommodations and what Chad had said about um, having follow-up meetings. The... Um, once, once you have an IEP in place, it is not, uh, it's, it's not written in stone. If there are adaptations and modifications that you need to make, for example, a student who is, n who is uncomfortable speaking into software in front of others, a lot of these kids are very shy, um, or the adaptation modification just doesn't work, you can make the changes. And I think that that's the, the value in, as a parent, you have equal Equal footing, the hierarchy should be very level in calling a meeting and in running the meeting. Do not be intimidated because they have all, the, all these degrees and, and, and all these acronyms. You're the parent, you're the child's first teacher. You, you have equal ability in controlling that meeting and you should not be bullied into doing something or accepting something that's inappropriate for your child. And that's the key. It's not best, it's what's appropriate. It's a free and appropriate public education. and what is appropriate for your son with Duchenne, and that's why getting information from other parents may be helpful, but it may not be ideal in your particular situation, so do what's right for your child. Just to piggyback on that is, if you're in the IEP meeting, and they're writing out the goals, and you look at the goals, and you say to yourself, this doesn't fit my child, it is absolutely your right to say, this isn't gonna work. You know, we need to change it and this is how I think it should change, which is exactly what Brian is saying, that it's, you're on equal ground here. It's very easy to be intimidated at these IEP meetings as a parent um, to getting to sign something that you know doesn't really fit your child. So, you know, don't be afraid to speak up and say, this isn't gonna fit. Right, you have the right to review and appeal is what David is saying. Yes, um, but it definitely does not, ha I'm sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. But it doesn't have to be an adversarial relationship in any yeah. way, and it, it, and it feels like it, it may be taking on that tone sometimes. Having that positive relationship, and the IEP is, the whole purpose of an IEP is to give a child that needs extra the least restrictive environment, you know, like, like as fewest accommodations as you need, for them to do what everyone else does. And Duchenne is somewhat unique in that no matter what, there are some things that our boys don't need to do or they're not going to be able to do. You know, there's nothing we can do in adaptive PE that is gonna get them to be able to be the starting quarterback when they're a junior. It's not like the way that it is with academic things, with reading and with writing and with those things. But we, we want them to be fitting in as much as possible with that socialization. We want them to have the most opportunities to succeed and take those AEP, AP classes and to, you know, to, to do all the things with the accommodations that are available and that can be provided. And so, so that's important too. And teachers are well-meaning and, you know, and so with those goals, some of them are gonna write goals that are lofty goals, but if, if you, when you're in high school, they start to ask the kids in the IEP, because your, your, your children should be at those IEPs by the time they're in high school for sure. I would encourage it at middle school as well, that, that your child is there. And when they ask, you know, what are you looking for for transition or for after high school? Those should be realistic goals. As Brian mentioned, they're gonna change, um, but realistic goals for them to be thinking about their future after high school, because these guys are going to be adults and what can they do? What do they want to do? This can be hard questions for us when we look at their limitations, but, but what can they do? What do they want to do? Are there any more questions? We're getting close to the end of our time. Um, I would like to just reemphasize what Gretchen said. 
education is a long-term relationship, and so the better you get along with the people that provide the resources to your child, the easier the process goes. Um, I, I think it's always best to certainly stand up for what your child needs. You know your child the best, but try not to be adversarial about it. From my own personal experience, I think an IEP meeting might be the most intimidating thing I've sat in. I'd much rather argue with the resident in the ER than I would to sit in an IEP meeting. It's a big <laughs> table, it's a lot of people, they have a lot of letters behind their name, they have all of these forms that they want you to fill out and there's all these processes that have to be followed. Um, but you have every right to speak up and you have every right to make sure that you know your child the best, you are the expert. And I've always found it's great to find one person that I connect with and that's the person that I rely on. And you build that relationship because educators don't leave their jobs that often. I mean, oftentimes you'll go through school. My second child is 12. He is, does not have Duchenne, but he has significant learning disabilities. So my older son, who's now passed away, but would be 24, it is the same um, psychologist as was there with my older son. It's the same special ed person. All these years later, I walk back in, different kid, different issues. We get along great because we built a really good relationship 10 years ago. And so I think it's important to go in, Jill Castle always says, go in with cookies and Starbucks coupon, um, gift cards and everything goes better. And you don't have to bribe people, but it is nice to be appreciative. I think there's one so, more question. So quickly, my comment wasn't about uh, to be the adversary. No, parent. I understand. It's, it's to be yeah. confident that, again, right. the hierarchy should be level. And if you're confident right. in that, again, you are your child's advocate and that's how you should act. I want to kind of dovetail on that and simply say that, um, yes, initially IEP meetings are very intimidating, but I think educators appreciate parents who are involved, appreciate that parents are building relationships, and if you frame whatever you're discussing in terms of what's best for the child's education and you put it in context in the big picture of things, why it's important and uh, what would be helpful, uh, I think as long as it's, yeah, you, 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 and I also took an opportunity to make sure I thanked all the educators because they're, quite frankly, they're spending more time with my kids during the weekdays than I am. And uh, I, I think as long as you go into that context and build that relationship, it's a lot more fruitful. I couldn't agree more. Um, in closing, I just want to put up some resources. Education Matters is wonderful. There's three volumes. Um, mm -hmm. I would advise you to download it off of our website, take a look at it, you can print it, you can provide it to the educators, you can provide the link so they can pull it up on their own computer. If you need a printed copy, let us know, we can mail one out to you. Um, there's chapters that take a look at adaptive physical education and learning and behavior. And there's also an education masterclass that we put together for teachers. And so take a look at that. If you're interested, we can provide the information for your teachers to go through and it teaches the education, the part of Duchenne that's educationally um, imperative. So we do have a lot of resources. There's, I'm sure, other resources available beyond PPMD, but this is what PPMD has. So um, thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And thank you for being at our conference. It's so nice to see everybody's face again. And um, good luck to you. And if there's anything we can do, let us know. And thank you to my panel, by the way. That's my biggest thing. Yeah. <laughs>